Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the European American Wind Energy Seminar Series. Uh, this is our second year of holding these uh, seminars, and we welcome anyone interested in wind energy research. So please tell your friends and colleagues. Um, this is hosted by a project led by Jakob Mann, who will introduce today's speaker. Jakob? Thank you very much, Sue. It's a real pleasure to uh, introduce Julia Goschel. She's a senior, no, she's a chief scientist and lead of the wind analysis group at uh, Fraunhofer Ives, where she's been the last 13 years. Her research revolves around remote sensing and uh, developing new measurement systems and measurement concepts, uh, ways to uh, process the data. Uh, among other things, she's also been involved in development of floating gliders. And she is very active in pre-normative and normative standardization, meaning things that can lead to something in the standards. And she currently leads the IEA Wind Task 30, no, 52 on large scale deployment of wind gliders as an operating agent. So uh, Julia, please. Thank you, both Jakob and Sue, for the, for the introduction. And it's nice to see our, a few known faces here in the audience and um, maybe also get, yeah, reach out to further people through the recording later on. Um, yeah, my presentation today is, is about a type of floating ladder as well, but not on buoys, but, but ships. And this is a short overview of what I'm going to tell you. I will um, start with an introduction addressing the challenge of measuring offshore in general offshore, but also um, offshore wind resources in particular, before I introduced um, our approach with the ships, so lighters on ships. And um, there I will focus on three aspects. We will talk about uncertainty quantification or verification. Um, we, I will introduce a, a low-level jet study we performed um, together in the team in, at EVIS and um, another study about the validation of ASCAT derived and ERA-5 offshore wind profiles before I come to the conclusions of my presentations. Um, yeah, and let's jump directly into the introduction. So what is the challenge basically about measuring offshore? This is a poster I found from um, 2011, so quite, quite a while ago from um, some people who at that time actually were collaborating on the so-called Northwind project. Maybe you've heard about it. Um, or you can, can look it up. And in this poster, they actually tried to give an overview how you can measure offshore. At that time, you, you must imagine we were really at the beginning of developing offshore wind. Wind energy in particular was already quite successful. And then it was just straightforward to go offshore. But as we already had established the process for doing site assessment and wind resource assessment for, for onshore, the question was, how can we do it offshore? Because obviously it's, it's not that... Um, straightforward, and it says not trivial, that's the original text from the poster, to measure the offshore wind resources. Um, here they suggested at that time, and I really, I, I um, found this poster because I could remember it at that time, that was around the time when I started to look into this, this field of research as well. They said the typical data resources are offshore map masts. That's a typical one, the same technology we, we were used to, to um, apply onshore. Floating lighters were really in an early phase, and with this we mean, mean buoy-based lighters, lighters on existing platforms. That was their approach in the in the Northwind project. Satellite data were already known with some very important work, for example, from, from DTU colleagues. And the last um, but not least one were mesoscale models and also reanalysis data sets. Um, then in the text, and this is just copied from the poster, they said actually only one of these five can be can be thought of a standard approach, which is obviously the MET mast, and can be considered as bankable. All the others need to be proven, need to be investigated. And it was already obvious at this time that were pro and cons for, for the different, different types of data sources. Um, looking a bit closer at the MET mast, we actually, so this is a, a picture from, from the German bite here in the Baltic Sea, the German part of this in Germany. You may know I'm, I'm from Germany. We were quite lucky because um, the government took some, some money and invested in MADMAST, um, namely the FINO-1 
two and, and three infrastructures. These three mat masts were 100 meter tall mat masts and they were used for a lot of studies. That was really long before they installed the wind farms. You can also see here on the picture. Um, but it was already very clear at that point that this is not the standard approach. We can't afford these mat mast infrastructure um, for every single project, offshore wind project we want to develop. And also we can't afford this everywhere in the world. Um, on the right hand side, there's another, that's, that's actually one of our studies where we um, try to collect all more or less known mat masts that are suitable for offshore wind resource assessment um, in Europe. This is all in Europe. With, in, for this study, we were looking for, for the time series longer than three years, basically, because we were also looking into extreme conditions. And you can see basically there are a few others. Again, the the phenomatmos in Germany are the most um, oh, yeah, best monitored, let's say, longest time series. There are a few others from commercial projects, but that's it, basically. And that is going until 2020. You see here, these projects here in, in UK waters mainly and also in the Dutch North Sea, um, they already decided around 2015, 2016, that actually matmosts are not the technology we want to, to go for. And that's mainly because of costs. So the new technology, and there was, you may remember already one, one of the five listed was the so-called floating ladder systems. And here you see from a review article we wrote in 2017, um, they all look a bit different, but what they have in common is basically a lighter, for example, here or here or here, integrated in a, in a rather small buoy when you compare it to other, other platforms in the sea. Um, this kind of technology is today, um, we can say the de, de facto standard measurement technology for offshore wind resource assessment, at least in Europe. This is um, because we actually will see they measure the mean wind speeds. And with mean wind speeds, we mean the, the 10 minute means in a, in a very good accuracy, with a very good accuracy, very close to what we are used to from the MET masts. Um, it's a lot of development. You see different OEMs, different manufacturers went for different designs, but in the end, they all provide the same data. This kind of de development started and around 2010 is still ongoing with newcomers um, every now and again in, in the market still. Um, already in 2013, there was the so-called OWA roadmap. There was a, a guideline document developed by the Carbon Trust within the so-called Offshore Wind Accelerator Program which is um, in short OWA. And this was a document really really um, meant to, to push te this technology into commercial acceptance. So they were kind of a bit, a bit like pre-standard, pre-normative standard, um, saying how to use this technology, how to interpret this data, how to make sure that the data quality is good enough. And this helped a lot. This helped a lot, this technology. So you see it's only three years from the early early um, designs to this document to push it into the market with another update in 2018. And actually this year we developed, um, Jakob, you, you mentioned, I'm, I'm pretty active in pre-normative and normative standard. So I've also be, been involved in this activity. We have um, published a so-called draft technical specification that this abbreviation within the IC program for this kind of technology. So that's what it makes a de facto standard measurement technology. Um, just an example from the German bite. Um, again, this is Germany. You can remember it on the world map or um, imagine it on the world map. And um, what you see here, actually, this is the system. Jakob also mentioned it at EVIS. We have developed our own system, which we now um, uh, offer as a commercial service, but also for research. And we actually had the pleasure to, to provide this to the first commercial floating ladder measurement campaign in the German North, North Sea some years ago in that patch here. So this is one um, development area where they're just planning and building the uh, a wind farm these days. And um, the interesting thing is that all these data are publicly available. So although it was meant to really be a wind resource data set, it can be used for research as well because it is publicly available to everyone. And this is the same for all. So this is the entire German bite. And you see all these, these, these patches. These are the, the wind farm development areas. Um, we started here in that area. This is where we also had the Fino one mat mast. And then um, with the years, 
and in the upcoming decades, we are going further, further out, further offshore. And almost for all of these areas, since the very first one, which is actually located here, that's the one I showed you before, um, for all of these, um, there have already been some floating LIDAR measurements or will be floating LIDAR measurement campaigns over at least one year in the upcoming years. And in the end, the good thing, all these data will be publicly available. So you have tall profile data from LIDARs, um, as we said before, accurate measurements over the 10 minute means for all these areas. And this is actually what we have already available two data sets in the public database for Germany. But we have the same for the Dutch waters published by RBO. And we also have, this is a slightly different system. Um, there's a so-called marine data exchange for the UK waters where we have a similar approach with published data. So this is how offshore wind moves forward. But actually a lot of public data for also for atmospheric studies and everything you want to do in research. So um, the question, and well, we're not through with the presentation, so this is not where we want to stop. Um, the question is, is this enough? Or can, do we actually need more, more areas? And um, before I answer this question, just I wanted to show this one as well. This is showing actually the accuracy of these um, these data where we compared the buoys with the MATMAS just to confirming that we really have are within the reference uncertainties of um, of the MATMAS. Um, the next slide is actually so on the one hand side we have the high accuracy of floating ladder measurements. On the other hand side, we do already see what I um, wanted to, to hint, at, hint at with the, the public um, availability of these data. These data sets are used for model validation already. So this is a screenshot from a presentation that was given by ECMWF at an IA wind topical expert meeting earlier this year. And um, what you see here is one of these BSH German data set that was used as one of the first data sets to, to validate error six. So what you see here is the, let's say, old or known error five da data in comparison for, this is the three months test period that was published earlier this year um, in comparison to the error six results for exactly the same, um, the same site and this is how we actually see the, how these data are reused in, in research and, and development, for example, of the new um, reanalysis models. Um, so now to the question, is this enough? Are we really, you see also here, the, the validation data points from some more, both MATMAST and floating ladders, can we work with this or do we actually need more to validate models, to do wind resource assessment for entire areas. And um, this, is, this is a rhetoric question. The answer is actually, it would be nice to have something that is covering large areas. And this is something we can do with the ships. Um, and at this point, I would like to introduce you the, the, the ship lighter technology we have developed or we have pushed over the last few years and which we have investigated with, with a couple of measurements, measurement campaigns and, and analysis studies in, in um, various research projects. So what you see is here is exactly the same lighter or same lighter type we have integrated in the buoys or have seen being integrated in the buoys. And this time we have put it in a quite experimental setup on a ship. So basically it has two boxes. This is a lighter and some additional equipment. We also have some, um, some weather stations, some um, simple sensors to, to accompany this, but basically it's a lighter plus some motion measurements that help us to correct the data. And this was one of our very, very early campaigns um, done by my colleague Gerrit Wolken-Mühlmann. And in this campaign, we put it on a, on a, a pretty small boat and um, made basically a study around the Fino 1 mat mast and the Alpha Ventus wind farm that is around this or located close to the mat mast. Um, what we did with the ship, you can see here. So and basically in blue, we have the, the ship track. Um, this is a wind farm consisting of the, the 12 5 megawatt turbines um, erected, well, it's, it's about 10, 15 years um, old now. 
in the German North Sea. And this additional dot here in front of the first turbine row is the Fino 1 mat mass. So in front of, I mean, directly in front of one of the turbines. And that was exactly the data set that was there for, for quite a long time to really develop this, this area in Germany. So you can see on the four different days we were investigating between 5th of October and 8th of October 2013 already. Um, the ship was doing different tracks with different purposes. And basically, um, it's in this publication, it's about two objectives. One was to compare, to verify the measurements of the ship against the, um, the offshore map mass, just to get an hopefully a confirmation that the measurements are as accurate as a map mast or close to it. And the second objective was, you see it here, um, where you can imagine what we wanted to measure here behind the wind farm. It, it, this was about wake, wake effects. So already an application of this kind of measurement approach. Um, these were the data we got. So you see um, uncorrected data, basically. Then um, two types of corrected. So maybe you only focus on, on the fully uncorrected data in, in green on the top, in the top panel, and the, the fully corrected data in the, in the bottom panel. And we compared it to the black curve, which um, was reference um, data, the reference wind measurements from Fino 1. And we see 10 minute mean wind speeds here. Um, what you also see is the distance to the mast. And for the verification, we focused, of course, on the um, periods where, where we were pretty close to the mat mast. And particularly here in this study, we, we looked at the first three kilometers. And when you do this, when you look at these data for the entire campaign duration, we got something like this. So this kind of correlation. Um, again, this time in, in red, you have the uncorrected data. And in black, you have the corrected data. You also see a plus minus 0.5 meter per second threshold in the linear regression of this. And what you basically see here is that we have a pretty good co correlation. If you compare this to the, the floating LIDAR correlation we've seen before, it's in the same range. We have an R squared of 0.99. That is for this kind of distance. So remember, we are still in, in the worst case, we are three kilometers away. We, we consider this as a, as a verified accuracy for the measurements. And this, I have to say, was the most direct, the most direct verification against the suitable reference measurement we could do with this, this kind of technology. So keep this in mind to evaluate the, the performance or the, the accuracy, uncertainty of these measurements. The second part of this presentation, as I said, was the, the wake study. And I have to say this was a very early, very preliminary first, first try. And basically you see on these plots, so this is the, the track we are considering. Um, we had westerly winds, so the prevailing, that's the prevailing wind direction for this, this part of the world. So we get um, nice, yeah, and in parts triple wakes. Um, you see this here in this contour plots where you have the different um, wind speeds and turbulence intensity values. This time we have one minute average values, and you also see it here in the time series. So on the um, horizontal axis, it's it's time. At the time, um, basically, where within that the ship was moving. So it was not just a time where, where the, the wakes were developing, but basically the ship was going from, actually, I don't know what, I think from, from here to here, um, from um, top to bottom or the other way around. And this is why we go through the four triple wakes. And you see it very clearly for the different height levels of the lighters, both in the, um, the mean, uh, mean wind speed reduction, wake deficit, and an increased turbulence intensity. Um, so obviously, we can also observe wakes with this approach. But I have to say, this was, this was not completely new. So already, um, well, this was a bit motivated maybe from a study from Rebecca Barthemi and, and co-workers published in 2003, where they also used a, a vessel placed a soda, so an acoustic remote sensing technology instead of a lighter. And basically, so you can consult a study published in JTEC, um, very similar things. But um, we have to say, actually, I think we have in the already in the 10 years in between, but also in the, in the next 10 years until now, we have um, could observe that, that LIDAR is 
the dominant technology for wind energy purpose are not sold anymore. But I guess at this time, they only had a solar available. And you see it also works on ships. Um, from this, so again, this was a very first study. We continued with this. And um, we used this in the next study not to observe um, short periods and single cases, but what we really wanted to measure are wind resources. So something that is a bit more going into the direction of climatology, which um, requires a longer peer, longer measurement period and also a longer measurement period, or a bigger data sample at the specific locations. And for this, we um, took a ferry boat, basically. So this is the original ferry boat. You see here in this um, cutoff picture, the placement of the LIDAR. It's exactly the same LIDAR. Um, the technology, the, the setup was a bit updated um, for this campaign, but otherwise the principle is the same. And this time we measured over something like um, three months, if I remember correctly, and um, made use of the ferries that was going back and forth between um, Kiel and Klaipeder, so the Southern Baltic Sea. Um, every day. So it's about 20 hours taking one trip from one harbor to the other. Then we had about four, we can see the next plot, four hours of harbor time and we're going back. And this is also indicating by the color code here. So maybe an advantage, maybe also a disadvantage of this particular campaign was that we were actually around the same hours of the day at the same location. So you see it here. Um, the time we had offshore, um, we're always in the, in the very early hours. Um, what we got out of this is, is shown here. So again, you see, if you look at the, um, the left-hand side first, we have corrected and uncorrected data. So here, the, the uncorrected is the, the red and the purple or pink. And then the corrected data where we get rid of the motion effects are in blue and, and black for wind speed and, and wind direction respectively. And we have also marked the, the times where we have basically no motion effects, at least not on the wind speed, only our uh, rotation on the wind direction, seen in the wind direction. These are the times where we are on the harbor. And you can also see it's what I said before, it's about four hours every day. What you see on the right hand side is basically the information we get from the corrected data set. What you see very nicely, it's not just the wind speed, it's really the entire profile. And we get a first hint here what it can tell us about the atmosphere because while well, we are making use of the LIDAR measurement, and it really gives us what we expect from a LIDAR, namely the information about the profile, about the, um, well, some, some hint of st um, stability and so on. So we get the whole benefit of a LIDAR, but traveling around a pretty large area. Um, in this publication, which is basically presenting the data set that was um, conducted as part of the new European Wind Atlas project in, um, uh, 20, I think it was 2016, was it here? It was 2016. Um, we did a first comparison with the, the WARF um, simulations we, we did for, for the new European Wind Atlas. So the data we have used here shown again in, in red and in, in purple are data from the NEVA pre-run. So the very first um, simulations in the NEVA configuration. And we see we actually get a good, good idea what the model tells us. And the other way around may have a good opportunity here to do some model valida validation with this approach not just covering one specific site that may be well or not so well reproduced by the model, um, but for the entire area as shown here. So really the covering a, a quite substantial part of the Southern Baltic Sea. Um, just as a side note, this data set, so it is, it was pub made publicly available through the NEVA project, but not in, in the full, um, well, let's say fully easily accessible, but it's actually part of the project um, that was mentioned before um, by, I can't remember, Sue or, or Jakob. So the next presentation in, in this um, seminar will be about the flow project and the, the flow data hub actually, that will make, for example, also this data set publicly available so that you all can, can redo these, um, these comparisons. 
Um, so after this step, what what do we what are the questions that are left for for these kinds of measurements? It seems that we have um, wind wind speed measurements with everything all the benefits we can get from a lidar itself. We have a reasonable accuracy and we can do model validations in a way, or we do have validation data which we don't have from really don't have from other measurement sources. Um, these are, were first first ideas from really early studies, but we wanted to further investigate in, in the um, following studies, what is really the accuracy of this measurement? Can we get for a specific campaign or more general, a better understanding of the accuracy so that we actually know how we can apply the data? And what are in general or in a broader sense, the, the best um, use cases, the best ways to, to apply these, these measurement data? for various studies. To answer the first question, well, that's a tricky one, actually. So we, we did this very, I would say, um, with a lot of effort, actually, to do this first initial comparison with the phenomatmos, but actually taking a ship. So we, um, uh, we chartered, really, a ship to do these measurements, to do this. To, just to verify your measurement technology is, is a very exp expensive approach. So you normally you don't want to do this. You actually want to use, make use of the ferry light approach because you have maybe the ferry, you have access to the ferry for free and you want to have a cheap um, and straightforward measurement. You don't want to, you know, convince the ship to or the vessel to go around the madness first. So we normally, we don't have this opportunity. What we did instead, and this was done by, by my PhD studio, who, student Hugo, um, you can try to use all your knowledge about LIDARs and motion impacts, which we have also developed for the buoy applications, to um, get an idea what, how accurate these measurements should be. And if you maybe get some, some preferred, some, some better configurations in comparison to others that actually um, give you the optimal measurements. And that's what he did in this publication. So he really looked into the um, geometry of these measure, um, measurements. He tried to understand the impact on the different timescales of the measurements for different LIDAR types and um, found basically, this is just one example re uh, result, different dependencies on the different parameters we have in the model. So what you see here is the relation between, so we have the um, the uncertainty in horizontal wind speed in the um, contours. And this plot show, shows how it depends on the horizontal wind speed itself, but also the speed over ground, which is basically the speed, the um, one dimensional speed of the ship in the direction of the heading. In his study, he also saw that this depends on the configuration of the LIDAR. So uh, this is wind cube. You may, may recognize this. Wind cube has four beams, so it does make a difference if your um, if your direction of the ship. So this is you see the, here the the course of our ground if it's in the direction of a beam or is it if it's in between. These things you can study in, in with a theoretical uncertainty model, and then better understand your LIDAR. On the other hand side, it's um, well, we do need to understand our our physics, the physics of the LIDAR measurement principle, get an idea of the different timescales we, we have and relate this to the timescales of the motions. So this we can do um, as an alternative to um, a side-by-side -side verification or calibration we normally do. And all the rest, so the, the calibration of the LIDAR, we can, of course, do without the motion, or we can learn from what we know from the, the floating LIDARs from the buoys. Um, so much about the accuracy. Then the next question, the use cases. And there actually, I, I would like to go a bit deeper into the two studies that were also done by, by Hugo in the last years. I'll give you a summary of these. And the first one, as I said before, is the, the evaluation of low level jets. And in the second, we will have a quick look at the validation of um, satellite, in this case, ASCII derived offshore wind profiles and error five results for the same quantities. So for the first study, he used exactly the same data set um, we had measured for the NEVA project and checked because, as I said before, we have this very nice um, profile information. So you see it here. Basically, we have the, the LIDAR measurements for 10 different measurement heights. 
And this we can compare with profiles. We get both from uh, from Neva and Era 5 directly. So you may know Neva is basically um, uh, yeah, WOF um, applied to downscale the Era 5 data. Um, this is what we have in green with the, the Neva derived um, measurement heights. And in blue, these are the, the Era 5 um, heights, measurement heights derived from the pressure levels directly. And um, what you see here on the, in the left figure is the um, low level jet occurrence over the Baltic Sea for one year. And this is exactly what we wanted to investigate. So we wanted to check with our measurements if um, we get the same information. So if you consider the low level jet as a critical um, offshore wind phenomenon that has actually, and we know this, quite a big impact on, on the wind resource, but also on the, the power output of future wind farms. And so this is actually the motivation to doing such a study and hopefully while well, checking if you actually get this, the, the statistics right from the models you have at hand. So he, well, this is again the, the track of the ship in comparison to the, um, the grid cells for era five here on the, on the left-hand side and the three times three kilometer resolution for, for Neva. And what, what he basically did is he, he was checking the next and also the, the surroundings. So he had different approaches on the paper, different statistics where he um, used the measurement data along the track and then compared it to the next, next grid cell, the next relevant grid cell. And this is the main result. So here you have actually on the left-hand side um, the frequency of the low-level jets according also, well, I, I don't go into the details of the definition here, um, the statistics for different hours of the day for the three different data sets. And um, also to remind you, this red shaded area is where, um, but that's actually what we did not, did not study any further. Oh no, we, well, you do see it here. Well, we also, um, this is a time where we are in the harbor and you also see it here on the, on the B, panel um, who has shown the, the fetch length as well and the distance to shore. So that's why we actually get to zero here because here we are on the harbor. So focus on focusing on these areas, we see um, we do, and we knew this from other studies, we do have an underestimation of low level jet accuracy, both in Neva, not as bad as in error five, but actually the LIDAR measurements, which Due to all the uncertainty and investigations we did, we have the most trust and give us a higher, um, higher occurrence. And this is almost the same for all um, times of the day. And um, well, on the right hand side, you see again the frequency bias. So this time as bias, not as um, as a, a direct occurrence, occurrence, occurrence value. Um, for different distances to shore. So the same information that is shown here in, in, in green. And we do see that the bias tends to increase for larger distances. And also this is something that was suggested by previous study, but in this case, we, we really have a confirmation from a quite exceptional, quite unique data set. And um, we do think that the, the ferry lighter data are, have quite some value in, in doing such a study and confirming actually something that um, was suggested by previous study and definitely needs to be tackled in order to, to make the models, um, which should, have, should give us a fuller picture and kind of exactly such an information to make them better and more suitable actually for um, such investigation in the context of offshore wind. This is about the first study. Coming to the second study. Um, here, it was really about validating um, some data sources. And again, we have used ERA-5 because this is, as you may know, an extremely popular data source in offshore wind and many other areas of R&D as well, but in particular in, off in offshore wind, in the um, offshore wind industry these days. And um, also, well, the second, um, the second data set we wanted to, to, to compare and to validate was an 
um, wind profile data derived from ASCAT satellite measurements. And for this, well, if you have a closer look, you see it's not exactly the same campaign. It's also in the Baltic Sea, but this time a bit further north between um, Stockholm and I actually can't see what does it say here. It's close to Hel is it Helsinki or not? Um, it's Turku. It's Turku, yeah. It's now Helsinki is further further south, right? This is Turku. Thanks, Jakob. <laughs> so we use this this actually because we could um, get access to to the Stena Line ferry. Um, you again see the the track here. Um, against the hour of the day. And what you see in the in the bottom panel is um, the satellite measurements that are available for this area. So um, you may know if you if you have worked with satellite wind measurements or wind measurements that are derived actually from satellite measurements, you know, um, we have, well, on the plus side, it's, we really get a good, we get, yeah, basically um, a, a good cover of, of areas. It's not just a single measurement points. We, we can um, study the, um, the behavior of the wind in entire areas, but not all the time, not continuously because the satellite is, is, is going around the, um, the earth and is, is only coming and you, this is exactly what you see here is revisiting particular areas um, only at certain hours of the day. Um, so this is sh shown here and we basically, so in this study, we, we picked the data we can, um, we can collocate from um, the satellites, our measurement track. Again, we, we were measuring for several months. Um, going back and forth on this ferry, plus the error 5 data, which is actually the easiest in this context because it's available everywhere all the time with the one hour resolution we had. Um, and then we got something like this. So what you see here is the mean wind speed um, at 100 meter. No, it's actually for 10 meter at the upper panel and 100 meter here at the lower panel. Look at the wind speeds um, as a as a um, color color contours, and this is giving you um, for for ASCIT, we have the left panel, and for for ERA five we had to have the wind speeds um, on the right panel, so we could generate these maps, and for the entire well, collocated period or the period where we could collocate the measurements. And this then we use to, um, to make comparisons with our reference measurements from the LIDAR, which we again gave the most, had the most trust in. And um, on the one hand side, so as a first step, we looked at a profile. So we defined six different locations because we had the suspicion that the distance to the shore is quite critical for this comparison. And then for, for these six locations, we compared the wind, wind speed profiles we, we derived or extracted from the different data sources. And only, obviously only the LIDAR measurements are direct measurements. Um, the ASCIT measurements are derived using some, some modeling in the background. And ERA-5 is again um, derived from the pressure levels. And what you see on, on first, side is um, we we have, so the, the agreement changes quite a lot. We have for the E location, for example, here, we have quite a big um, overestimation from the from the ASCAT here, whereas we have, have a reasonable agreement between error five and the measurements. Um, is a bit different here for the, um, for the A location. And so it changes really, and why does it change along the track? Um, this is for sure the, the impact of, of the, the, yeah, the coastal, the coastal effects or the coastal terrain. Um, in another comparison, actually, we looked at our continuously or more in, in, in a finer grid, we looked at the wind speed bias um, for particular heights. So we have 60, 150 and 220 meter height. And we have all the different longitudes in, in some binning and um, see the direct bias between um, the, yeah, in, in purple, we have error five. And in, um, 
orange, you have ASCID in comparison to the reference. And again, you see that you have, in most cases, you have an overestimation by, by ASCID, where C is error five comparison is, it looks a bit better in particular for C is a 220 meter height. You do see quite a strong impact in both coastal regions. So both in um, close to Stockholm, and then if it's uh, the, the Finnish part, um, um, further, further east. Um, so the question, of course, now, and you can see this this publication is still in preprint, it's still in the review, and, and we're having very in-depth discussion with the, with the reviewer at the moment, because the question is, is this relevant, actually? So how much do we do we trust the ship ladder measurements, and how can we relate these deviations, how we can compare them to the measurements and certainty of the, the ship-based ladder measurements itself? And um, with this, actually, I want to come back to the start of my presentation and just with a um, yeah, proclamation, basically, postulation, um, what we have seen before and what we really believe in. So we do have a confirmed low uncertainty of both the offshore map mass and the floating ladder systems. And just to, to emphasize this again, we, we do believe that, that the floating ladder systems do meet the map mass accuracy, so really are able when we, we talk about buoys, are able to replace mat mass for the purposes of, of offshore wind. And that was um, when I remember actually um, the time when we started working with floating lighters, that was, that was a kind of surprise because we really were not expecting that it's so straightforward to get rid of the motion effects. We also do believe that when we use a ship based um, instead of a buoy, that we are in the same region. So we have uncertainties that are not considerably higher. Um, it's a bit more tricky to um, to show it. So just to remind you, we had this, this tricky um, verification study. Otherwise, we have to do a lot of um, theoretical modeling. So in terms of traceability, when we, we talk in standard terms, standardization terms, it's a bit more tricky to, to make use of the ship LIDAR measurements because we cannot place them just against a mat mast and have them measuring in the same mode as we want them to measure during other studies. But still, we be believe that we can control the motion effects and really get an uncertainty that is low enough to use the ship ladder measurements for validation and calibration studies. And this is some, so you see from the original five data sources that were suggested for, for offshore wind resource assessments, we do think we have measurement data that have an abs absolute accuracy and traceable accuracy to, to some reference, which we then can use to um, validate and also calibrate both satellite data and mesoscale data. And this is, this is really useful because it gives us a kind of hierarchy how to use these different data resources and how to, to learn um, more about the, the offshore wind resources and use them to, to plan offshore wind projects. Um, but that's not everything. Actually, um, I, I made a, a hint to this, or gave a hint to this in the, in the abstract already. Um, it's just not just offshore wind. So in the past years, we were actually um, asked to support different atmospheric research campaigns all on, on ships with our measurement technology because we do offer with the ship, light, uh, ship, ship ladder measurements we have developed in the context of wind energy, extremely high accuracy wind speed measurements that are also desired and, and wanted by atmospheric research groups. And with exactly this technology, we have um, participated in the last few years in, in a couple of campaigns. Maybe you have heard um, of some of these. One is the Eureka campaign um, around Barbados. We have also participated in the, the Boti campaign. Um, you see the track here together with people from the, the MPI and um, Max Planck Institute in Hamburg in, in Germany and the Geomar. Um, this was a Pretty exciting campaign in the in the Arctic on the Nansen Legacy ship, um, where we had two ladders installed and really had the opportunity to measure in, in very Arctic conditions. And at the moment, we are preparing for another tropical campaign um, together with Professor Stephanie Fiedler from Geoma, where we will travel yeah, first to um, to Brazil and then measure actually this developments. Um, the direction to the Cap Verde Islands, also with exactly the same measurement and making use of the, the accurate wind measurements we are able to 
provide. And this is yeah, just the, the very last conclusion or the very last takeaway. Um, you may also know about this publication, one of the Grand Challenges papers looking at the marine atmospheric boundary layer. And um, this is actually, so this is, this is telling us what should we measure, what should, what, what should we model, what do we need to model, um, what do we have to further develop our activities in, 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 this, um, in this area. And in this publication, they actually focus mainly on buoy-based measurements, and ships are only mentioned for intensive operation, observation periods, IOPs. Um, but we actually think that also in this context, applying the ferry light approach gives us an opportunity to not just have, um, let's say, floating moving measurements into in, within IOPs, but also provide more long-term campaigns um, from a moving platform with LIDARs and all the other technologies we, we can, can apply there. Um, this will add, as we've seen, very much accuracy to these kinds of observations. We, we can provide accurate, accurate measurements and as an extra benefit, and this is something that becomes also more and more interesting to the offshore wind industry, it's not just the wind measurements we can, can make from such a platform. It's pretty straightforward also to, to integrate other sensors like, for example, microwave radiometers for, for temperature and humidity profile measurements, in addition to the lattice, which are more and more wanted and desired actually also to, to study, for example, um, offshore wake effects and similar. And with this, I hope I um, could convince you that this is a, a good way to go and that we, we have made some achievements here. Thank you for listening. Um, I would also like to mention all the, the collaborators you have seen on the papers, colleagues who've worked with me on this topic for um, working on this, for investigating a lot of this uh, within the last 10, 10, 15 years. And this is, I'm at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Great presentation, great overview. So maybe... Uh... Sue, will you steer the q and A? I'll be glad to uh, monitor the q and A. Um, thanks so much, Julia. What a great talk. Um, this is interesting that we can get that kind of data, and especially I was fascinated um, with the the ferry data that went on for months at a time. As a modeler, of course, um, my question is, you know, given that you you showed that the models are under predicting things like low level jets, boy, would it be great to have data like that continually and um, be able to use it for data assimilation into the models. How feasible would that be? What would it take um, you know, to deploy a few of these um, on, you know, continually on ferries so that they could be used for DA and could they be made real time so it would be usable for that? Yes, <laughs> it's a short answer. So normally actually for another presentation, I had um, one slide where we showed the you know, the, 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 the offshore traffic all over the world. And we know there are lots of ships who can actually be equipped. Um, and in principle, these systems are, are simple systems. They can be operated in a standalone mo mode. We, we don't have to be on the cruise or on the, on the ferry to, to really work with these systems. And also the, the data is not extremely heavy. So you can reduce the data if you only, um, if you focus on, on 10 minutes or maybe even hourly ones, it's, it, it should be implemented in a way. It is um, much more cost efficient than um, thinking about buoys. So what we use for um, for the site development, it's basically the system costs and um, well, yeah, there's still some barrier, but it's um, in principle, yeah, in principle it should be possible. Okay, and of course, and some, the, of course they are, yeah. No, go ahead. Please. And so the motion correction is uh, automated enough that you could yes. do that real time. Then okay, great. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, does anybody else have questions you'd like to ask, Julia? Um, yes, I have a question. Um, hi, Go ahead. Julia. Thank you very much for your very good presentation. Um, 
I actually have two questions. My first question is, I would like to know how you're currently handling um, anomalies in your data measurements. And secondly, I would um, like if you could please explain a little bit about your uh, motion effect correction. Um, yeah, how do you, what kind of methods and how do you do this? I just want to learn about this. Thank you. Yeah, I try to, to find a suitable suitable picture, maybe this one or the other one. Um, so an anomalies, this, uh, we, we basically apply the same the same filtering as you do for, for the standard use of these systems. So normally they come with a recommendation to filter out certain, um, well, for the wind cubes, they, they um, report CNR values. So they basically um, interpret the spectra, spectral data they get and they have parameters they apply to this. And following these recommendations is normally enough to, to prepare the data. So to be very, well, it's a very simple answer. We don't need any any additional outlier filtering or an outlier detection in, in addition to what you do to a standard a standard use of this, these technologies, which we just integrated on a ship. And then the second part is, as you also would already mention, is just the motion compensation. Um, it depends a bit what, what you need for the measurement. So um, I, I said this in the presentation, we actually were surprised how how, how um, easy it is to, to use this data. So for the buoys, for example, for the mean wind speed data, we only basically only need to, to correct for the heading of the system, so the rotation of the system, because the other effects mostly average out. Um, it's the same here. So the um, we have basically three, or maybe it's the other picture, this one, um, three, if you can see it, um, different effects. One is the, um, the heading of the ship, which gives you a wrong wind direction. It's not a very, normally the ships don't rotate very fast. So it's, it's basically an offset you have to know and which is um, quite easily, um, can be measured quite easily with our satellite compass. Um, the second one is the, the speed of the ship. So um, these most of the ships we have used, they, they move with a speed of about 10 knots, which is quite a lot. Um, but again, if you compare this, if you compare the changes in speed with the, um, the measurement principle and the time scales we have in the, in the measurement of the remote sensing device, it's just an offset. So also here, the, um, knowing this, knowing this uh, speed offset and applying it in a, in a very simple, um, a simple mass is, is enough. And then the third category is a tilting, which is um, much less for ships than for a buoy, for example, but it's a very symmetric motion. Also for the ship, normally it's very symmetric, um, both in, in roll and in pitch. And here we actually, when we only look at mean wind speeds, um, this rather, rather low resolution, we don't correct for this explicitly. When you look into something like turbulence, parameters, turbulence intensities, you have to consider it. But when you only look at mean wind speeds, it's a good approach just to um, yeah, let it let it average it, itself out. Does this answer your hey. questions? Yeah, it appears Anna Mitro has a question. Yeah. Uh, hi, Yuria. Uh, my question was also on, about this slide itself. So, so what uh, from the the contour plot, I see like the there's a higher uncertainty when the speed over ground is higher. Uh, so my question mainly is, uh, do you think like this pattern of uh, high uncertainty when uh, the speed over ground is higher will continue even with like buoy based uh, lidar systems, or is it something like just for ship based lidar systems that you have seen? Um, where well, we have we don't have we. Well, we don't have a lot of translation, trans translatory motions, this is the word, um, for the buoys. So they don't move a lot. They, they mainly rotate. So it is um, here just simply coming from the assumption that the, um, the uncertainty we have in the speeds are percentage uncertainty. So it's a percentage value. And that's why they increase actually when, when the absolute wind speed is getting higher. And that's it here. So th this is based on its a theoretic, a theoretical assumptions, um, both for the um, horizontal wind speed mm -hmm. dependency and the the input actually the correction with the speed over ground we have have assumed a, um, a constant percentage uncertainty. 
speed uncertainty. Right. Okay. So, so uh, for for uh, any other kind of system, uh, you you imagine it to be easier. Yes. Right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further questions? Okay. Let's thank Julia again um, with a virtual applause. <laughs> um, great seminar, Julia. Really appreciate it. Next month, we'll be back on our every other uh, Wednesday schedule. And as Julia already adver advertised this, we'll be talking about the um, flow project from Europe and the open access databases. And it will be a group presentation. So we'll be looking forward to that. Um, so thanks for joining everyone. And we look forward to seeing you again next month on November 13th. <laughs>